All right, just another day. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> um, homework eight. Last homework assignment of the semester is due Wednesday the 30th. Um, there isn't going to be an assignment related to the stuff we're talking about today, but of course it's important for other reasons, you know, related to your career, and we do have the final exam still outstanding, so it's good stuff we're going to be talking about today. Wastewater plant residuals management. Any questions before we get into the material? Okay. So, um, course screenings. Um, there's a lot of different categories of things we have to dispose of besides the water that's been purified. You know, what we had coming into the treatment plant was this mixture of um, solids, grit, fats, oil, protein, water. There's just nutrients like phosphorus, <laughs> nitrogen. There's the, and even some toxic pollutants sometimes, organic and metals. So there's this mixture of stuff coming in, and the whole point of the wastewater treatment is to take this mixture, separate it, and then to ameliorate the pollution where we can by, for example, reducing the BOD or digesting fats, um, and then discharging certain things to the, to the water uh, that's receiving it, like a river or a lake. But there's going to be uh, certain things that we've extracted from the water that have to be disposed of another way, that they're not going to end up in the river. So the thing that we take, the stuff we take off the bar rack is an example of stuff that it's not going into the river. So rags, sticks, bags, tires, uh, jewelry, drugs, all the stuff that you get out of the, um, the bar rack has to be disposed of. And usually what it's done is just, it's taken to a uh, solid waste transfer facility. Sometimes it's washed before it's disposed of. Um, but what our textbook suggests is that the range of volume for materials that are collected is between 3.5 and 35 cubic meters per million cubic meters of water that's treated. If it's sanitary sewer, and then in the case of a combined sewer, which remember a combined sewer has runoff from um, storm sewers and domestic sewers together, that the upper range of coarse screening volume is much higher. So instead of being as high as 35 cubic meters per million cubic meters, it's up to 84 cubic meters of this solid material. And that's because in the case of combined sewers, there may be inlets at the roadway level. And so things like uh, Pepsi cups and uh, straws and um, other materials that just make its way into the sewer from great inlets and curb drains go to the treatment plant and then those also are going to be extracted from the bar rack. So there's much more. So just to warm up our brains, let's consider this example of the Han uh, Huntington Sanitary Board here in town. I looked up their average daily flow and it's 13 million gallons per day. So um, it's pretty common in situations like this to take all of the coarse screenings and dispose of them at a solid waste facility by using a roll-off uh, bin. And so um, a 30-yard roll-off bin is a pretty standard size. It's 22 feet long, seven and a half feet wide. So that's wide enough that it can fit on the back of a truck that's gonna take up you know, a standard lane width. And then six feet tall isn't monumentally tall where it's gonna be higher than the, um, the discharge end of the bar rack. It's just kind of like a pretty tall average height. So that's 30 yards. And I, I guess sometimes people get sloppy about the units. What they mean is 30 cubic yards. So 30 cubic yards. So what I'm saying is if we use this 30 cubic yard roll-off bin, and we've got the Huntington Sanitary Board, which, by the way, here in Huntington, do we have a combined sewer or a sanitary? Combined. It's combined. Yeah, you may remember that we talked about this before, that part of the city is a standalone, separate sanitary sewer, but much of it is combined. And so let's just analyze over the course of this range, you know, at the low end and the high end, how long would it be until we fill up this bin? You know, are, are we going to be changing out multiple bins per day of course screenings? Is this bin going to last for a month? What's the range of possibilities on how quickly it's going to fill up? And you'll notice that I've given you some 
uh, units correction, uh, some units conversion factors here. So let me pause for a moment and see if you can think through how to solve this one. I think what you probably already see is we've got a difference in units. We've got million gallons per day, and then this is in terms of cubic meters. So you're going to need to convert the flow rate of the water from MGD to cubic meters. And then also, you've got the cubic meters for the screenings, but yet our um, volume of the bin is in terms of yards. So you've got two sets of units conversions to make. Let me pause for a second so you can uh, start on these calculations. All right, so were you able to convert the flow rate into a units that makes sense here? Let's zoom in a bit. All right, so the 13 MGD, um, that is, the way that I did it here is I said, to get to a million cubic meters of water, that takes 20.31 days. And of course, there's more than one way to do this. I'm recording yet. Um, but to get up to that million mark it would take 20.31 days. And so what I said is at the low end of the range, there's 3.5 cubic meters of coarse screenings over the course of 20.31 days. Then that would mean to hit that, it's 0.1723 cubic meters of coarse screenings per day. Um, and at the high end, that would be 4.13. So then um, to convert that from cubic meters to yards, then it would be 133 days is the slowest it would fill up if we're assuming that it's accumulating at the lowest rate or would be as quick as 5.5 days that it accumulates if you had like the maximum end of the range, the 84 cubic meters per million cubic meters of water treated. So did anybody else get similar answers there? Between 5 and 133 days is how quickly that dumpster is going to fill up. And I mean, that's pretty typical that I, I think I have visited the Huntington <coughs> treatment plant before, and I think that they said that they um, change the dumpster out every couple of weeks. And that's not necessarily even that it's full every couple of weeks, but probably um, because they don't have a washing system for their screenings. Sometimes the screenings are washed just to make it less putrescent, as they call it, so that it's less smelly, odoriferous, it's not uh, rotting. But I don't think that they wash the screenings in Huntington, so they probably want to change it out more often than the bin getting completely full. Um, one of the um, factors that they have to keep in mind is that those screenings are wet when it gets into the dumpster. And so sometimes the dumpster will be lined with plastic just to make sure that the water from the screenings doesn't seep out all over the building where that's happening. Um, and also that it, you know when it's being trucked to the landfill, that it's not seeping water onto the road because that would be unsanitary if it's like dripping on the freeway and you know somebody's got their head out the window and they're following that truck or something. So, uh, any questions about this example? So an alternate way that we could have done this is I could have just converted the 13 MGD into cubic meters per day, but. I took, now in retrospect, kind of a strange approach. What I did was I calculated how long would it take to get to the million cubic meters. But in any case, you find a ratio of screenings to flow rate, and then uh, for the flow rate that you've got, you figure out how much volume per time are you getting of the screenings. All right, now if you need some more time to look at this Solution, of course, it's recorded in the video, so you can go back through if you've run out of time copying it down. But I do want to move forward because we've got a lot of additional things to talk about today. Uh, remember that if this, this is a list of things that we're taking out of the water and have to be disposed of. So the core screenings come from the bar rack. There's a grit chamber that settles out things like broken glass, sand, metal shavings, fragments of bone, seeds, eggshells, and so on. All that stuff which would damage pumps um, have to be removed and disposed of. 
um, primary sludge, which is between 2 to 8 percent solids, and of the solids, the majority of it's organic material, and there's a lot of nutrients in that as well. It's going to be broken down through digestion, which we'll talk about today. Um, it can become anaerobic really rapidly, and so sometimes when it's in a storage area, when the primary sludge is being stored, you have to add quite a lot of air to the st sludge to uh, prevent it from becoming anaerobic until you're ready for it to become anaerobic. Um, if, if you're intending for the sludge to become anaerobic to digest it, then there needs to be uh, a cover over the top to keep the odor down and to help keep it warm because the anaerobic process proceeds much more quickly when uh, the sludge is warm. So here's just a picture of the roll-off box and the screenings being dumped into it. You can see that in this case it's both grit and sand that they're putting into their landfill, but also the screenings that are uh, coming out of the bar rack. Okay, now secondary sludge is different from primary sludge because primary sludge didn't have any um, enhanced process to increase the concentration of microorganisms. So the sludge in secondary treatment, instead of being mostly organic material that's like the raw waste, instead of being mostly human waste, which is what primary sludge is, secondary sludge isn't mostly human waste. Secondary sludge is mostly bacteria, um, dead bacteria that have settled to the bottom of the secondary clarifier, or even live bacteria, and other things like rotifers, and you know that spectrum of biology that we've talked about earlier before. So all of the wasted excess cellular material. So waste-activated sludge generally has a lower solids content than primary sludge. It's only half to two percent solids. The rest of it is liquid. Um, still, the majority of those solid, uh, solids are organic. A trickling filter is a higher concentration of solids than waste-activated sludge um, because the, uh, there needs to be less volume of water going over the rock media to keep the organic layer wet than the volume of water that's in the aeration basin, uh, mainly for oxygen transfer reasons. You know, the oxygen transfer across the liquid layer is much more efficient in a trickling filter than the blowers where most of the air that's going in gets to the top of an aeration basin and goes into the atmosphere and only a small fraction of it is actually going into solution. Tertiary sludge is what we call sludges that are generated during either biological or chemical processes that specifically exist to remove nutrients. And so if you're precipitating out phosphorus or if you're precipitating out nitrogen or you have some sort of specialized biological steps that remove those nutrients from wastewater and you've got a separate sludge from that, then the tertiary sludge may have higher concentrations of the nutrients and therefore could be more valuable if you're going to be land applying the sludge. And then there may be liquid residuals that are completely separate from anything else like um, special solutions that are used to wash membranes that are used in um, some aeration basins use membranes for removing the water rather than a, uh, having a secondary clarifier. Sometimes they'll just have a membrane inside the aeration basin and draw the liquid out that way. And when they do, they have to wash the membrane occasionally with acids. And so there may be special liquid residuals that are separate from everything else that have to be disposed of. So sludge can be disposed of through preliminary options that uh, screen, grind, degrit, protect the equipment downstream. So we've talked about preliminary treatment and how that affects sludge. Thickening is a first step of water removal. There may be subsequent steps or more vigorous efforts that we take later, but thickening is a phrase that's used to mean the very first step that's moved to remove water. And we'll look at some pictures of these different things like uh, rotary drums and centrifuges and uh, dissolved air flotation. So we'll talk about measures that are used to thicken the sludge. Stabilization can be a chemical or biological process that makes the sludge um, less objectionable by 
um, inhibiting putrefaction, which is like the rotting of the sludge or the decomposition outside of the treatment plant. Stabilization by adding lime, usually. You're just increasing the pH and generating heat. It will reduce pathogens and make it safe to apply those materials onto the land and in places that people may come into contact with it. So stabilization just means that you're transforming the sludge material into something that's less dangerous or less objectionable. Conditioning is applying some sort of a chemical that makes it easier to remove water. There are polymers that can be added or um, you can change the pH and it will have a differential effect on how much the water can be extracted and so it's just any sort of special adjustment that's made so that dewatering is more effective. So dewatering, the difference between dewatering and thickening is dewatering is um, after thickening and it's like really trying to get it as dry as possible. Whereas thickening is just maybe um, trying to reduce the amount of water so that there's a higher concentration of solids in the sludge, like maybe taking it from half a percent to three percent, which doesn't seem like a lot, but you'd be reducing the volume of sludge by a factor of, of six if you did that. If you take it from half a percent solids to three percent solids, there would be one third as much sludge volume after that process. And so thickening is very valuable, but still it would be 97 percent water after thickening and so dewatering would be trying to take it from, say, 97% water to something much, much lower. Like, um, you know, if it's 97% water and 3% solids, at the end of thickening, you may have something that's 12% solids, which doesn't seem like a lot. But at 12%, it visually looks like um, kind of like a wet clay at this point. It looks much more solid, and it, it doesn't flow anymore. It has to be shoveled when you're getting into the... 12, 15, 20 percent solids range. So that's uh, accomplished through things like filter presses, drying beds, and then reduction is uh, things that like composting to digest any further organic material in the biosolids or drying the sludge out or incinerating even it. There are some places that burn sludge to reduce its volume anymore, even more than the other steps. As far as operations, one of the interesting things about sludge is you may remember from fluid mechanics the idea of uh, Newtonian fluids and non-Newtonian fluids. Now this is a graph of viscosity. Uh, so shear stress applied on the vertical axis, the velocity gradient is you can think about the rate of deformation of the fluid. And so a Newtonian fluid like water is something where the viscosity stays the same regardless of how much you're pressing on the water. But then there are things like, um, do you remember the lab that we did where we had a mixture of cornstarch and water? And when you stir it really quickly, its viscosity increases. So that's a shear thickening fluid, sometimes called a, uh, a dilettant. That's this D curve is that the viscosity is increasing with the shear stress. But then there's also shear thinning fluids. A, a pseudoplastic is a shear thinning fluid, like ketchup is a shear thinning fluid where when you bang on the bottle, not only are you applying a force, but that, that uh, shear stress that you're applying reduces the viscosity of a pseudoplastic shear thinning fluid. Now sludge is different from all three of those things. <coughs> sludge is not Newtonian, it's not shear thinning, and it's not a dilettant or a shear thickening fluid. It's a Bingham plastic. A Bingham plastic is something where you have to apply some shear stress before there's any movement of the fluid. So sludge, if you have some sort of a pump that's moving very slowly, the sludge won't deform. Until you get the pump moving up to a certain amount of shear stress, then it kind of it gets things moving, and from there, the uh, viscosity relationship is linear. So this shear stress that's uh, where the, the diagram intercepts the y-axis, this shear stress amount is just how much uh, force has to be applied to the fluid before it starts to move. So it's a little bit different from water. Pumping sludge is different from pumping water uh, because of this Bingham plastic behavior. Um, we usually pump slow, uh, sludge at low, visco uh, vo low velocities, which means that in a pipe it would be common to have laminar conditions. 
which is nice for us because when you've got laminar flow, it's pretty easy to calculate the friction factor F. If we go to the Moody diagram, you may remember the Moody diagram, and you know, it's kind of complicated to find the friction factor unless you're in this laminar range. Then it's really easy to find the friction factor because all you do is you just look at the Reynolds number, take it off of this curve, and you've got the friction factor F really easily, and you can put that into the Darcy-Wiesbach equation to find the head loss behavior of the fluid as it goes through a pipeline, for example. But because of the Bingham plastic behavior, sludge, uh, although it's flowing at a laminar rate, there's more resistance to flow than would be predicted by this approach of using the Moody diagram and the Darcy-Wiesbach equation. There's a correction factor in our table that tells you how you'd have to m use a multiplication factor, K, if you're finding the head loss at a certain percent solids concentration. So if you've got an untreated primary sludge at 6%, for example, you'd go up and you'd see that it's about four times as much head loss as would be predicted by just this usual laminar flow friction factor. So you can see that as the solids concentration increases, the multiplication factor goes up as well. So the fluid mechanics of pumping sludge is a little different than just pumping water. So you've got to be aware of that. And because of that, it's common to use different types of pumps for sludge than we'd use for water. Usually water these days is mostly pumped through a centrifuge pump, um, a pump that's spinning around and it's got an impeller that's adding energy to the water in the form of increased pressure. And so the water comes in on one axis and it leaves on another as it's uh, being spun around and accelerated. But sludge is often pumped through positive displacement pumps. This is a positive displacement pump where you can see that a screw is rotating through a cavity, an angled cavity, and there are these voids, these pockets, and as this <coughs> rotates, this void will sometimes be open and sometimes will be pressed up against by the blade that's on the inside, and so there's always some void, but it, because of the, the shape of the inside plastic piece and the shape of the... Uh, uh, the, I guess you could call it impeller in the middle, um, the void moves along, and so it's a, in the category of a positive displacement pump. So they're kind of an unusual way that we have to pump sludge, but you couldn't just send it through the same kind of uh, impeller that you do water because it's got this much higher viscosity and the strange Bingham plastic behavior. It's tricky to move around. All right, so in terms of dewatering sludge, we can use dissolved air flotation, which has little rising air bubbles, which suspend either individual particles of uh, sludge material or flocks that are grouped together by increasing the density of it or adhesion of the air bubble to the outside surface of an individual particle, which instead of settling, which it ordinarily would do, it would rise to the top because it's, uh, it's in contact with some air bubble and it increases the relative density of the particle such that it's less than water and will rise to the surface. And so the way that you get these little air bubbles to form is a, similar to a soda stream. Have you, have you ever seen a soda stream and how that works? It's got these pressurized gases and you push a button and it sprays a bunch of carbon dioxide down into the water. And I'm sure you've seen what happens when you open a can of soda, that the bubbles start to come out of solution. So in dissolved air flotation, what you're doing is you're taking some water and you're pressurizing it in a tank, pressurizing air in, in water. And by pressurizing it, you're dissolving the air into the water. And what they'll do is they'll take this carbonated water, and it's not just carbonated, it's instead of CO2 that's being dissolved, it's just the mixture of air, which is partly oxygen, partly nitrogen, partly you know, carbon dioxide, but it's, it's air in general that they've dissolved into water and then they uh, allow it to come out of solution. So just the same as opening the can. When you open the can, the dissolved CO2 starts to precipitate into gaseous bubbles. So it does the same thing in a tank. These little gaseous bubbles start to come out of solution. They 
uh, will intercept the particles of uh, sludge and rise to the surface. And then it's scooped off the top with a conveyor belt as, uh, as it rises to the surface. So this process can be a lot faster than gravity processes that cause the sludge to settle. Because gravity, remember, especially in the case of um, secondary sludge, secondary sludge is mostly microorganisms. And the density of those particles is only slightly greater than the density of water. You know, the density of water is one gram per uh, cubic centimeter. Well, the density of micro of bacteria is like 1.01 .01 grams per cubic meter. So the density is really close. It's going to take a long, long time to settle downward just under the gravity differential. But in the case of dissolved air flotation, if you get some air bubbles in it, then that changes a really big difference between the density of the particle attached to air and the density of the liquid. So dissolved air flotation is fast, which is why people like it and go to the trouble of like carbonating wastewater to make it happen. Uh, another way to reduce the water's content of sludge is with thickening by a centrifuge. And in contrast to dissolved air flotation, which is a continuous process, meaning water always comes in, water always goes out. Um, thickening sludge with a centrifuge would be a batch process. And so most likely you'd have to have more than one centrifuge. Or if you just have a single centrifuge, you'd have to have somewhere to collect the waste. And then while the centrifuge is spinning and you're dewatering the sludge, you'd have to be filling up the storage tank. And then you'd get the sludge out of the centrifuge. And then you could start filling it from the storage tank into the centrifuge. But the point is, is that it's important to understand the difference between a continuous process and a batch process. And this is a batch process, which is a bit of a dis disadvantage because continuous processes um, are always more efficient in terms of not needing an intermediate storage step uh, in addition to the treatment step itself. So here's a continuous process. We like that a belt filter press, which I've talked about before, but this is kind of just a nice side illustration that kind of gives you that view of how that belt is going around. And I, I told you about the, uh, the fabric towels that they sometimes have in uh, like uh, public places. And this is similar to that, where it's in a continuous loop where the, uh, the belts are dried off and cleaned. And then at the top, the sludge is squeezed um, between rollers and the belt to try and get the water to drip out the bottom. And uh, they separate the, the water and the solids part of it. And so the sludge is uh, becoming thickened and concentrated through this process. Now, scoop press is really fascinating. The way that this works is that the sludge comes in one end. And then if you look at these little screws, you'll notice that they're getting closer and closer together. So there is a slotted drain at the bottom of this. It's maybe like a mesh. And so the sludge is going to be losing water just because you know, it's in contact with this mesh. But then it's also getting squeezed at the same time because this certain volume of sludge is being compacted. And so it's kind of like wringing out a towel. I'm sure you know if, if you've ever, like with a, a washcloth or something, or maybe if you're washing your car and you want to get the liquid out of it, you'd squeeze it, right? You'd wring it. And so this is doing a similar thing to the sludge. A certain volume of sludge is getting squeezed as the uh, distance between the screws are, is getting smaller and smaller. And so then that forces the liquid out even more than it would just by gravity alone. So it's squeezing it out. What comes out of the bottom? is a sludge cake, which uh, is a much <laughs> higher concentration of solids. The sun and wind is a pretty effective way of getting moisture out of sludge. So dewatering it with just a drying bed also will form sludge cake. <clears throat> and then sludge cake has to be removed. And this is a batch process. You know, you'd fill the trough with sludge solids. And then over the course of a month or even a couple of months, just several cycles of the sun coming up, beating on it all day, uh, the wind drawing the moisture out of it, um, 
over the over the long term it will dry out and then um, these trays have concrete at the bottom so that front end loaders can drive and uh, just scoop it out basically put it into uh, a truck and haul it off either for disposal or haul it off uh, to be used in some productive way stabilization of sludge is what we have to do to make it less objectionable for the, the way that we're going to use it later. So increasing the pH above 12 will prevent um, odors and vectors. Vectors means flies that uh, would be attracted to the sludge. They're a vector for disease. A, a, a mice are vectors because they'll be attracted to, you know, like food and the spread disease that way. So Increasing the sludge by adding either quick lime, hydrated lime, or different kinds of kiln dusts will um, increase the pH and that will precipitate things like calcium and phosphorus nutrients. And then it also this um, pH increase process generates a lot of heat as well, which you may remember from when we were talking about precipitation of um, uh, in drinking water you know, uh, lime softening, lime soda softening is highly exothermic. So it's good for two reasons, because the pH by itself will reduce the uh, putrescence of the sludge, but also as it's generating heat, that's important to kill off pathogenic bacteria in the sludge, because we don't want people to get sick if this sludge is going to be land applied. Um, sometimes the lime is added to the liquid sludge before it's been dewatered. And it's easier to mix it up correctly that way if you pre-treat. But the disadvantage of adding the lime to liquid sludge is that then you have to use more lime. Um, if you add the lime post-treatment, meaning after the sludge has been dewatered, then you don't have to use as much lime, but it's trickier to mix. And so more attention has to be given to making sure that there aren't any pockets of uncontacted sludge that don't have the lime added. Um, if you're going to treat the sludge with uh, lime to increase the pH, there's two different standards that are um, used. One standard is class A, which is a pretty high requirement that the pH has to be kept above 12 for three days and the temperature has to be above 52 Celsius. Um, so that's much higher than our body temperature. And the idea of keeping sludge that high is it's going to kill off any bacteria that's adapted to the human body. Over the course of three days, there's, there's no bacteria that's going to be dangerous for us. There still will be bacteria in the sludge, but it's going to be bacteria that live at 50 Celsius instead of, I mean, human, I don't know what, 98.6 in Fahrenheit, convert that to Celsius, it's probably... 25 or something, I don't know, 26. Um, but class A criteria is applied to when humans are going to come in contact with sludge during uh, biosolids. But if biosolids are going to be used in some place where human contact is less likely, then class B criteria can be used and it's less stringent. The pH doesn't have to be kept above 12 for nearly as long and the temperature requirement isn't as high either. So biosolids is a euphemism for sludge. And we use this phrase biosolids when we're trying to do something productive with a sludge. We're trying to fertilize crops or condition soil. And so remember in the previous slide I was talking about class A and class B. Class A biosolids can be used in public places like home gardens, public access areas. Class B could be used in agricultural areas where uh, you know people are also are obviously involved in applying it, but uh, people aren't hanging out in a cornfield having a picnic. You know, um, just not frequently visited by the public is the criteria for Class B application. Now, there's limits on the concentration of metals that's allowable for different types of land applications because these are toxic materials, and so. You know, even if the bacteria have been killed off, that doesn't just mean that the sludge is innocuous and that it couldn't cause problems. You want to have a pretty low concentration of lead over the course of a year if you're going to be using um, the land 
that this sludge is applied to for growing food. So let me show you some slides I think are really fascinating for how they can productively use these biosolids. Here's a vehicle that has a big tank on it full of sludge and it's driving through a cornfield and dumping sludge into a uh, trench that it digs. It's not just spraying the sludge over the surface because that would attract flies and it would smell bad even if the sludge is stabilized. So what they do instead is they use these knives to dig little furrows in the soil and then they inject the sludge, you can see these hoses, they inject the sludge uh, six to eight inches underground and then that'll keep the flies away and um, it also is a good method of dispersing the nutrients because there's phosphorus and nitrogen in here. I mean, this is kind of a win-win. We're disposing of biosolids and also adding valuable nutrients to the soil. So you can see the knives, they drive through the area while they're injecting the sludge and then what you end up with, you can, there's a little bit of standing water at the bottom um, but it'll, over the course of a few days, it'll seep into the soil and distribute the nutrients. So it's a beneficial use. Here's another way to utilize sludge solids. You could make bricks with it, mix it in with clay. And the advantage of that is that when you fire the bricks, it disinfects the sludge because, you know, it's really hot. And then it puts little voids as the organic material, um, volatilizes. There's little voids in the brick and so that can have favorable characteristics if you're trying to make a lightweight brick. So there have been a lot of different uh, thoughts given over the years to ways to break down sludge. So when we get together on uh, Monday of next, Monday a week from like you know after Thanksgiving, we'll pick up on talking about anaerobic treatment of sludge. So we'll just leave it here Today. Hope you have a good Thanksgiving and uh, let me know if you've got any questions on that homework assignment. So I'll see you in 10 days.